everyone is an equal member of the team with equal responsibility to do this. So that's all I want to say today because um, it bears reminding and it bears contemplation. Thanks. All right, so I'm gonna just take a moment to introduce our neurocritical care speakers today. Um, I'll introduce both because their um, presentations are in tandem about anticoagulation. Um, and I appreciate the two of you teaming up today to talk about this. Um, so I've introduced both before, but just briefly, um, Dr. Carvalho Poiraz is uh, one of our neurocritical care team, one of our newest members who completed her undergraduate degree in neuroscience at Colgate, followed by MD and PhD at Columbia, uh, residency and fellowship at uh, Columbia and then the Columbia Cornell Combined Neurocritical Care Program. And she has an interest in um, transfusion medicine and anticoagulation in the context of intracerebral hemorrhage. And then Nicole Davis, who is a PharmD clinical pharmacist with the critical care team, whose expertise lends a great deal of value to the um, management of medications in the neuro, neuro ICU. Um, she'll be uh, a part of this uh, presentation and lending her expertise to the discussion. So thank you, Nicole and Fernanda. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share screen, um, but I appreciate you guys letting us come in to do this. Um, can everyone see screen? Yes, yes. Okay, so what Fernanda and I are here to talk to you guys about are is factor 10A reversal. So some of you may have remembered, I was here talking to you guys about the same thing back in November of 2022, but there's been recent change in the literature. So the next at I, um, which was published last Wednesday. So kind of wanted to take this opportunity to break it down and kind of see where we all stand at this point in time. So I'll just go through the background. Fernanda and I will be handing off to each other um, talk about different things, but I'll go ahead and start off with our literature background. Uh, so what we're truly comparing and what we're talking about right now is comparing Indexinet to our PCC products. Um, so as a reminder, Indexinet acts as a dummy receptor for apixaban and rivaroxaban, um, maybe weekly for adoxaban and noxaparin. Um, but it has reversible binding, meaning that eventually the Indexinet can, can unbind from a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban, and the patient can be re anticoagulated. Um, but for a period of time while you're infusing, it should bind to a Pixaban and Rivaroxaban. And it seems like our biomarkers of anti 10 A seem to reflect this. Um, whereas our PCC products, Case Centra and now Balfaxer, so Balfaxer recently came to market as an alternative to PCC, exact same product. Um, so at Mount Sinai, we're likely going to be using them interchangeably to get uh, more favorable pricing. Um, but that, uh, PCC products are factors 2, 7, 9, and 10, all inactivated. And what it does is it creates a thrombin burst, so overwhelms the clotting cascade with additional factor. So while not acting as a specific reversal, it is overcoming that inhibition um, lent by a Pixaban and a rock span. So to kind of bring us back, I'm not going to go through all the old and extra four stuff at this point, but I do want to kind of compare the numbers of the two best trials that we had for IndexNet and for PCC. Um, even though these trials, they were not done together, they're completely separate patients, but the patient populations do look very similar. Um, so Nexa 4 was kind of the trial that got IndexNet uh, approved by the FDA. It was versus nothing. Um, so it was just, we gave these patients IndexNet, this is what happened. Um, so majority ICH patients, um, I'm not gonna go through the patient population, but Essentially, what they found was excellent to good hemostasis in that population. Now, the fixed ICH trial was a multi-center retrospective trial where they gave patients PCC products. Um, and the PCC product was K-Centra, and there was a variety of dosing. But what they found, because they made sure that their population had the exact same inclusion and exclusion criteria as an exa 4 did, um, so they actually found an excellent to good hemostasis of 81.8% using the exact same definition that an exa 4 used. 
Um, so in terms of death, so fixed ICH found in hospital deaths in 19% of patients, and X4 had deaths in 30 days in 15% of patients. Um, and then the thrombosis rate supported in X4 was 9.3%, fixed ICH had 3.8%. So these were the two biggest and let's say best trials. So let's keep in mind they were versus, both of them were versus nothing. Um, so then the one trial that I did want to talk to you guys about before we turn into an XI is the FAM trial. So this is probably one of the bigger trials that we had available where they directly compared IndexNet to four-factor PCC in a real-world setting. Um, so this was done in a multi-center down in Florida where they included patients who were having an ICH and had recently ingested Rivaroxaban or Apixaban and then uh, subsequently received either IndexNet or four-factor PCC. Um, so they did use usual dosing, so their four-factor PCC dosing was a bit on the higher end at 50 units per kilo. Um, and then they actually used the exact same excellent hemostasis definition that an XF4 and 6-ICH, so it's a definition defined by the ISTH group, um, and they had to have had a repeat CT. Uh, so they were looking for changes in ICH volume, BTE, mortality, as well as cost of treatment. So um, I did describe for you kind of what these ICHs look like. Um, so around 55 to 58% had regional mass effect. Um, 41 to 48% of these patients had midline shifts with similar GCS and ICH scores. Um, so in terms of what they found, um, so they found around 70% of patients, both in indexinet and four-factor PCC, had an excellent outcome um, with similar rates of good and poor hemostatic outcomes. So same difference in their primary outcome, no statistical significance was found. Um, and then for their secondary outcomes, they also did not find any difference. Um, their rates of VTE were similar across the board. Um, and then with inpatient mortality, the index and alpha group did have a higher mortality rate as compared to the four-factor PCC. Um, and then the only difference they actually were able to find was cost and treatment. So IndexNet costing around $23,000 um, with four-factor PCC costing um, around $6,600. Um, so they did also try to look at long-term outcomes. They did not find any difference, um, but unfortunately the MRS was not consistently collected because it was a retrospective study. Um, but what they did look at, they didn't find a difference. Um, and they did admit that the cost comparison cannot account for all factors. So like if they had decreased length of hospital stay or ICU stay, it wasn't able to capture that. Um, and they did try to address the prescribing bias of giving indexinet to more severe patients, and they performed a regression analysis on this, um, so looking at patients who received indexinet and had a higher ICH score, and they did not actually find um, any type of relationship. The other thing they looked at, we, I'm not going to, I'm going to go on end on the study, but they also did look at blood pressure. Um, as we know, blood pressure is a very important aspect of the management of ICH, um, so I think it was helpful that they did address that. Um, so then the last trial I'm going to talk about in terms of our background before we get into an next to I is there was a systematic review and meta-analysis published in 20, end of 2022. Um, this is not an industry sponsored. You do have to be careful because there's a couple of meta-analyses out there. Some of them are uh, Alexion and AstraZeneca sponsored. Some are not. Um, so this is one that was not sponsored. Um, so they did, they included around 900 patients uh, who received four-factor PCC and 500 patients received indexinet. So just briefly going through this, really what we're finding is, even in this meta-analysis, similar rates of anticoagulation reversal. Um, so for the anticoagulation reversal with how they defined it, 77% um, in the PCC group and 75% indexinet. VTE um, seems like maybe more, numerically more um, VTE in the indexinet group. Um, but uh, statistically, similar rates of VTE between the two groups. Um, so it's kind of where I want to end right now on the uh, background trial before we get into next. I'm going to turn it over to Fernanda. Okay, so um, I think uh, Nicole reviewed a lot of the prior studies uh, on um, Indexinet comparing with PCC. So before we get to the most recent study, which was an exo one that was just published uh, uh, this past week, I just want to like take a step back to talk about like the clinical, rel you know, how how clinically relevant is hematoma expansion in ICH and how does it relate to outcomes? So obviously our medical management of ICH is focused on interventions to control hematoma expansion. We do that through blood pressure control, reverse of, uh, of antithrombotics, coagulopathy. Um, in the INTERACT-1 trial, uh, it was estimated that every for every 
one millimeter, uh, sorry, one milliliter of hematoma growth, uh, there's a high uh, additional 5% risk of poor 90-day outcome. And many retrospective studies have validated that hematoma expansion is a strong predictor of poor functional outcomes. So it's thought to be really the largest preventable driver of poor long-term outcomes. However, there's some debate as to what what is the amount of hematoma expansion that's necessary to produce poor outcomes and what's a clinical me uh, clinically meaningful definition of hematoma expansion. Next slide. So this uh, retrospective study, I think, addressed a little bit of this, but obviously was done retrospective, so, re retrospectively, so there's several limitations. But it, it did uh, suggest that any amount of hematoma expansion or growth, uh, no matter how you define it, more than 3 milliliters or more than 33% of the hematoma, there's a, a, a high odds ratio of poor outcomes at 90 days. So hematoma expansion seems to be a robust predictor of poor outcomes, regardless of the growth definition. Next slide. In, the, in terms of interventions to control hematoma expansion, so blood pressure control is one of them, right? And um, there's data suggests that blood pressure control does seem to improve outcomes by preventing hematoma expansion. But I want to take a step back because even those trials were not initially in the way that they were designed, um, you know, straightforward. And in, in, uh, the ATAC-2 trial and Interact-2 did not initially show, imp show improved outcomes with aggressive BP lowering. And it required many post hoc analysis to uh, determine what the current recommendations are and guidelines for blood pressure, which is a reduction of blood pressure to 130 to 150 systolic. Uh, that seems to lead to less hematoma expansion and improve uh, poor long-term outcomes. So next slide. So this leads to the question of whether that which kind of like, a, um, you know, important for uh, analyzing the NEXA1 trial, which is, is there strong evidence that interventions to promote coagulation leads to improved functional outcomes? So next slide. And I want to talk about two prior trials that essentially, you know, achieved hematoma expansion, but did not improve outcomes. And um, I think with putting those that into context is important when we look at um, the NEXA1 trial. So one of them is the FAST trial, which was a trial that enrolled patients to uh, recombinant factor 7A or placebo within four hours of the ICH onset. It was powered to uh, show uh, an a effect on, on, uh, on long-term outcomes and uh, 841 patients were enrolled. And it did show that the giving recombinant factor uh, 7A did improve hematoma expansion. And that was clinically significant, um, 3.7 versus 7.5 cc's of, of hematoma expansion. Um, and it seemed like uh, thromboembolic events were similar when you looked at all thromboembolic events. But interestingly, and like notably, uh, there were more frequent arterial events in the patient's uh, arterial uh, thrombotic events in patients who received recombinant factor 7A, so 9% versus 4%. And for the main outcome, which was uh, functional outcomes, there was no difference between the groups. Next slide. In terms of um, reversal of antithrombotic, I think it's important to also look at another trial, the INCH trial, which, control, uh, which um, looked at FFP versus PCC. Um, in patients with ICH who were on warfarin. Um, and in that trial, patients were randomized to either FFP or, or, or four factor PCC. And uh, PCC was better at reducing the INR to less than 1.2 within three hours. It was better at uh, preventing hematoma expansion at 24 hours by a lot, so 22.3 versus 8.3%. Um, there were actually like very low frequency of serious adverse events, which was not really analyzed in that trial because it was not powered to compare groups for those for that outcome. But you know, importantly, there was absolutely like no difference in in the odds of functional independence at 90 days, 39% versus 37%. Next slide. So I think like this leads us to uh, the current trial. And I think with all this background, I think you can maybe uh, think about critically uh, think critically about this trial. So I'll have I'll hand it back to Nicole to talk about the, the study design. All right, thank you. Um, okay, so switching gears now to our current trial that was just published last uh, last Wednesday. Of note, you know, we kind of heard all this marketing about it, what was it, last summer? Um, so it did take 
almost 12 months to actually reach publication. They were presenting the results at various conferences leading up to this, um, but just did want to highlight it did take a long time to achieve publication. Um, so in terms of the patient population, so they included patients who ingested a factor 10 a inhibitor in the last 15 hours, and then they ha could have any acute factor 10 a associated intracranial hemorrhage. This was amended um, mid-trial uh, to exclude subdural and subarachnoid hemorrhage, so then it became only um, intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, they had to have an estimated hematoma volume of between 0.5 to 60 ml, uh, max NIHS of, NIHSS of 35, um, and time of onset had to be 12 hours from symptom onset to confirmatory CT to be randomized. And then this was later amended um, to six hours mid-trial. Um, some key exclusion was patients who had GCS of less than seven, um, NIH of greater than 35, and then surgery planned within 12 hours after enrollment um, or a thrombotic event within the last two weeks. So the way that this was designed, um, this was an unblinded trial and patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either indexin at low dose or high dose. Um, it just followed the package insert dosing of kind of when, what dose of um, rivaroxaban or pixin they had recently ingested and then how long ago they ingested to determine if they got low dose or high dose. Um, and then, or they could get usual care. Um, so usual care was determined to, by local physicians at their discretion, so truly could be anything, um, and they were not required to include PCC. Uh, for their endpoints, their primary endpoint was a composite, um, and all criteria must have been met to, uh, to have achieved a hemostatic efficacy. Um, so they included a change in hematoma volume, uh, NIH, so they want, were looking for an increase of less than seven points in 12 hours, and then they cannot have received any type of rescue therapy, including indexin at PCC or surgery within 3 to 12 hours after randomization. So um, coming to the results, uh, so the, and I guess like how many patients were enrolled, et cetera. So the study ended up enrolling 550 patients in 131 sites in many different countries. Uh, the, the trial went on between 2019 and 2023. It was stopped at the time of an interim analysis because, because it met criteria for efficacy for its primary outcome. Um, and But the efficacy analysis was done with the first 552 patients, but the some additional patients were included in the safety analysis, a total of 530 patients. Um, and turns uh they 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 could give either the low dose or the high dose indexinet. Most of the patients, 71.1% in the uh, in the treatment group received the low dose indexinet. Uh, uh and there was very little crossover, only seven patients ended up crossover crossing over. Um in a few patients, nine patients, there was an inability to uh, assess for hemostasis efficacy. And the authors mentioned that was mostly because patient had clinical deterioration or withdrawal of care. So they counted this, that the, those patients as having no hemostatic efficacy for the purposes of the analysis. Next slide. So here are the baseline, like at least like half of the table for the baseline characteristics of the patients that were enrolled. Um, you can see that the age was similar and it's somewhat, uh, you know, uh, characteristic of patients who, with ICH who are on um, factor 10 a inhibitors. Um, there was a similar proportion of, of females. Um, in terms of medical history, uh, what we see, I think, for the most part in both groups is like what's uh, representative of patients uh, with ICH who are on factor 10 a inhibitors. Notably, uh, there was a higher proportion of, uh, of patients with AFib in the endexinet group compared to the patients on the usual care group. And um, one other thing that's notable, too, is that, as Nicole mentioned, initially in this trial, they were enrolling patients with any intracranial bleed, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural, and, and kind of early on in the trial, they decided, no, we're going to just make this a ICH trial. Uh, so the majority of patients in the trial were ICH and not other types of bleeds, but there was a lower proportion of ICH in the endexinet group compared to the patients in with, um, who received usual care. Next slide. Um, this is the second half of the baseline characteristics. And what I wanted to point out here is that uh, it's notable that the median time from hospital presentation to receipt of, uh, receipt of the treatment, uh, administration of the any treatment was 
more than two hours in both groups, which I thought that was a little bit, you know, long. I mean, ideally, I feel like patients with ICH should be treated a little quicker, maybe um, within 90 minutes or so, but it was like more than two hours, but it wasn't so different between the two groups. Um, one major thing to, to be aware of is that um, the pa a patients that um, receive usual care, um, there was very little control or systematic, you know, approach to to what they got. Um, and notably, in fifty two percent of patients, it wasn't known what type of PCC they got. Um, we know that eighty five point five percent of the patients, the usual care, um, received a PCC and not something else. But you know, the the patients could have received anything, and there was it wasn't very controlled for. Um, so it could be four factor PCC, three factor PCC, or or FABA. So uh, unfortunately, the trial did not control for that too too well. Um, next slide. So here are the main results. I think the the primary outcome, the way this trial was designed, was to look for hemostasis. Um, so the primary outcome of hemostatic efficacy, which was defined as a composite. Um, of hematoma expansion, NIH stroke scale change, uh, and uh, need for rescue therapy. So based on this composite score, uh, patients in the indexonet group, uh, among patients in the indexonet group, 67% of them uh, achieved hemost uh, hemostasis. And in the usual care, 53.1% achieved hemostasis. And that uh, was statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.003, as you can see here. And if you look at the breakdown of the composite score, it does seem that the hemostatic efficacy seems to be coming mostly from achieving hemo uh, hematoma expansion and not as much from the clinical deterioration or need for rescue therapy. Um, they included some other endpoints here, like hematoma volume increase of like, like a big hematoma volume increase of more than 12.5 milliliters. And the, that was, um, appeared to be different between both groups too, 11.1% versus 16.8. Um, and they also had uh, excluding patients who had who didn't have those like follow up uh, um, data um, and the 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 change also seemed to be there with indexonet uh, having better uh, hemostasis. Uh, one thing that are not that's not in the tables, but they also reported and they looked at as an endpoint was the a change in anti factor ten A activity from baseline to the nadir of the 10 activity within uh, one to two hours. In the in, in the indexonide group, there was like a, a much bigger change in um, factor 10 uh, activity of like 95 point, uh, sorry, 90, not, around 95% compared to 27% in the usual care. Next slide. So this is a big one here because they, they also looked at adverse events uh, and long-term outcomes, right? Because uh, are things that are very important clinically as well. Um, and for thrombotic events, um, what they found is that patients uh, who receive indexonet had a higher risk of having thrombotic events with indexonet uh, patients uh, having 10.3% of them having thrombotic events and patients with uh, unusual care group, 5.6%. And, and very importantly, ischemic stroke, there was like a very big difference between the groups with indexonet patients, 6.5% of indexonet patients uh, having ischemic stroke after receiving the drug and only 1.5% in the usual care. So it's like a, it's like a four time increase um, in the risk of ischemic stroke. And that was also um, significantly different. Um, in terms of functional outcomes and, 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 and things that are clinically important that we want to see uh, in our patients. So one was like death at 30 days. Um, there was no, no, no difference between the groups 27 versus like 25%. Um, and then in terms of MRS, uh, long-term MRS, they only followed up patients up to 30 days after um, after enrollment, and there was no difference between um, of long-term functional outcomes. Next slide. So I'll hand it okay. over to you. Um, so just kind of want to touch on the logistic differences between the two. So what I have on the left side of the screen, I'm not going to read this. The, this is how you reconstitute index net alpha. So 
the way it comes, it comes in 200 milligram vials. Um, so with the dosing scheme, if you're going to give low dose or high dose, it may require five vials or even up to nine vials. So majority of patients probably will only get low dose. And I think there is some question about, you know, the rates of VTE and like, should anyone really be getting high dose at this point? But that's kind of a different question. But I just want to highlight, it is way more complex to make indexna alpha, whereas with K-Centra, it's a very simple reconstitution with a transfer device. So single reconstitution, it does mix very quickly. And then with K-Centra, we are able to give it via IV push. So IV push over three to five minutes, whereas Indexnet does require a cumbersome IV bolus followed by this continuous infusion. And then reminding everyone that it is reversible. So as soon as you stop the infusion, um, patients will begin to re-anticoagulate because it doesn't actually clear your DOAC. Your DOAC, it will stay there um, until uh, the, it's naturally cleared via its other kinetics. So... In terms of like what's realistic to get indexinet to the bedside, um, realistically, it's likely going to take one and a half up to even two hours to get it, just because it is a complex drug to make. Um, because of its cost, it's going to require pickup via nursing or hand delivery. We will not put this in the tubes. Um, and that whereas with Kcentra, we have data that says that it's safe to use tube station delivery. We do a flat dose of 2,000 units, so we actually no longer do weight-based dosing of K-Centra. Um, the flat dose has been established. It might have even less VTE. It's cost-effective, and it achieves the exact same hemostatic efficacy as weight-based dosing does. Um, and like I said, it's very easy. And then we're actually going to be piloting something new at MSH where we're going to have pharmacists responding to bedside with K-Centra. Um, so ideally getting K-Centra um, injected uh, very quickly. Hope our, target time is going to be less than half an hour. Um, so because uh, we're going to now start having metrics that are guiding um, anticoagulation universal, this is kind of one of the new things that we're going to be implementing. The last thing I wanted to talk about, and just to remind everyone, because I did talk about this last time, is indexinet alpha will cause heparin resistance. So this is going to be very tricky in patients, let's say they come in and they need some type of heparinization um, for a procedure immediately after getting their anticoagulation universal. Um, and dexinet alpha will basically cause heparin to no longer work. Um, so this is one paper that was published uh, in patients who had hemorrhagic stroke who then, you know, required heparinization for uh, stent placement or some other type of procedure. Um, and this is another one in, um, in a PCI, I believe, where they were actually looking at the ACT, and they were never actually able to achieve their goal ACTs because of that heparin resistance induced by indexinet alpha. So that is just a caveat to remember that you cannot heparinize patients if you give this drug. Um, so finally, and while cost is important to consider, I do think like it does pale in comparison to, you know, the hematoma expansion, the rates of VTE, but it is important to mention. Um, so right now with our current, this is our current purchasing. This is not um, pricing that's just readily available, but this is actually Mount Sinai cost data. Um, our, for IndexNet, we're able to purchase the low dose for 12,500. And for four-factor PCC, depending on our 340B pricing, it'll a flat dose of 2,000 units will cost between $3,000 and $4,000. Um, so we're looking, if we give it to 100 patients in a year, looking at a difference of 1.5 million versus 300 to $400,000. Um, so wrapping up before we get to our conclusion, the last thing I did want to mention is looking at some of the disclosures from the authors. Um, so 23 out of 41 um, did have or did accept some type of funding or money from either Portola, Alexion, or AstraZeneca, um, so over 50% of the authors. In conclusion, Fernanda? Sure. So I I mean, I hope you will agree with this, but have, looking at this trial, you know, and carefully and, and looking at all the results, I think, you know, the evidence does suggest that uh, Indexinet seems to be better uh, than PCC in in reducing that uh, interfactor TNA activity, yeah, the, in the labs that that did uh, that was the case. It also did prevent hematoma expansion. It was I, I thought it was better it prevent hematoma expansion, but I think the higher risk, the the big difference in the rates of arterial like arterial thrombosis, like stroke, um, and thrombo like any thrombotic event, um, is is very important to consider. Like, should we accept that 
much higher risk uh, of of stroke uh, in in this in this drug uh, in order to achieve hematoma expansion expansion special especially when you you consider that there was no difference in mortality or thirty day outcome altogether. So um, I I think uh, that's the conclusion that I that I got the main conclusion that I got from the from the study um, and we can maybe have a discussion later. But overall, I thought the, the there were some strengths to the study. It was uh, there were multiple centers across the world. I thought it was very generalizable. Um, the 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 demographics of ICH patients on factor 10A inhibitor, inhibitors, I think, was well captured. There was like a low rate of crossover, but there were many limitations. Um, one was the the pro protocol changing mid study, like first like including all intracranial hemorrhages and then only including ICH. Um, the usual care. Uh, arm was not very standardized. Patients could have received in like different types of PCC. Uh, the study didn't really uh, control for that very well. So it wasn't a, ideally designed to really uh, very cleanly, cleanly look uh, uh, for a comparison between Adexanet and like what would be ideally four factor PCC, which is what we use and most centers use. Um, it did not, um, it used this composite score for hematoma expansion. It didn't really use absolute, uh, it didn't give us all, all the absolute amounts of the hematoma expansion and like compare the distributions that would have been nice. They didn't provide that information. Um, they didn't report outcomes looking at uh, patients that, own, that uh, there, was, there was certainty that they received PCC um, in the usual care, I think it would have been nice to like separately analyze those patients um, in, in the usual care arm. So they didn't, didn't provide that. Uh, the primary outcome is a composite, also kind of like somewhat arbitrary, not necessarily something that was used in prior trials. So um, it's also unclear how it relates to, to the, the prior work and research in the field as well. So, you know, my Overall, how this is going to change my clinical practice, I think that I I, I would not favor using Andexanet over PCC given the higher rates of adverse events, especially the 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 much higher rates of stroke, and in, in this and, and when you consider that there was no improvement in functional outcomes. Um, so in this case, you know, a, a procoagulant can be very beneficial in, in preventing hematoma expansion, but uh, the the risk of thrombosis and especially stroke is uh, unacceptable, I would say. Um, so I guess we can open up to any questions. Yeah, I think I, I just wanna highlight before we open everything is also just like, I believe because this was an industry sponsored study, they had the capabilities of giving us the PCC data alone and excluding that 15% who received nothing. So like we still truly have no idea was this improvement hematoma expansion in Dexanet? Was that driven primarily by hematoma expansion in the non-PCC group? Was it not? So I feel like with this trial, we're actually still in the same place that we were. It just kind of has reaffirmed everything that we probably already knew. I really appreciate your critical review of this paper. I thought that was fantastic. And this has been something that's been challenging for us over the last five, six years since Indexanet uh, was developed and, you know, three companies ago. Um, and I've been really proud that Mount Sinai has continued to critically review the evidence and actually prevent uh, acquisition of this uh, drug. Um, when it first came on the market, if I remember correctly, it was priced 2x or maybe even 4x what it currently is. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important to know that the absolute reimbursement for a medically managed ICH patient is close to the cost of the high dose of index in that now I believe it's $26,000 if I if I have that number correct and the high dose of index in that is $22,000 so basically uh, this has been priced to nearly exhaust the entire reimbursement of the patient's hospital stay uh, you know in the first few moments of their um, admission and so it it really is it requires a critical review. And uh, I completely agree with everything you said. Chris, have you combined use of these medications with surgical procedures? Okay, Centra frequently, um, as we've been using that, but I believe we don't have Indexanet active on our, in the pharmacy as a result of the poor evidence over time. Um, and so I haven't used Indexanet Maybe that's not true. There, were, I believe there was one patient who got it at another hospital and was transferred over. 
Yeah, we uh, at Elmhurst uh, and 4HNH, we are about to come to a different conclusion. Um, we will be purchasing uh, Andexanet and uh, making it, uh, even if it's non formulary, available in certain cases. Uh, the way we come to a different conclusion than you guys is probably because I think the cost and the logistics are addressable. Um, there's many uh, drugs in uh, cancer that are extremely expensive, even more than an Exanet, and it's still worth it because um, the amelioration of the quality of life is uh, is more than ten thousand dollars. You said there's a difference in one million for a hundred patients. That means only ten thousand per patient, and amelioration of the functional outcome in neurosurgical patients is way more uh, than 10,000 per case. We have an issue because the ASAP and the American, the uh, anticoagulation forum is also listing Andexanet as a first line. So actually uh, we're looking into uh, having Andexanet uh, come to uh, HNH and we'll let you know uh, how we want to address the issues. In terms of the stroke, whoops, bye. In terms of the uh, uh, eliminating the risk of stroke and VT, you can you can say that you don't give it to AFibers and uh, people who have a history of VT. So we'll be addressing those uh, issues uh, that led to uh, more strokes and VTs. By I select think um, well, one I think it the ICH patient rarely can tell you their history. Um, so I think that that's going to be a very challenging thing to do. I do think the AHA is coming out with guidelines for the. Um, how quickly patients are reversed. And I think that it's gonna be nearly impossible uh, to be able to reverse people in a timely manner using Andexanet. And we're going to be missing those targets once that becomes a JC requirement, so. Yeah, and I would say also that you mentioned like improvement in quality of life. I mean, there's no evidence that Andexanet is better at improving quality of life compared to PCC. Um, that's, this trial did not show that. Any sense of how many other healthcare systems or hospitals are holding back on bringing in Andexanet? Are we alone here or is this kind of like, you know, 50% or? I mean, like- um... I don't have any, I don't have any numbers for you, but based on me surveying, like my colleagues at other hospitals, this hasn't changed it for anyone. And I've not heard of anyone choosing to add it to formulary. Yeah, um, this this uh these results have been presented in prior um uh, trials and like what talking to people, I feel like people, a lot of neurointensivists have similar concerns about the high rate of thromboembolic events. Um, but it's the same as when we started using TXA and uh, aminocaparic acid. You can be smart and just say. I'm not going to give it to somebody that had a fresh MI or has a stent or is a smoker and has a peripheral vascular disease. So there's ways of addressing the uh, the complications that we saw in terms of the uh, death and the uh, and the strokes in VT. So I think that's reasonable if you have better outcomes, but we don't have any evidence of better outcomes. So, yeah, so that, that, was, that was my question. Am I missing a point here? I, I thought we said that there isn't any evidence to suggest that it improves morbidity or mortality the NICH mm -hmm. patients, or are there other it's papers that it's suggest diluted, that? It's diluted because of the increase in stroke and VT. So if you remove that deleterious effect by selecting uh, patients better, then you get only the benefits of the reduction of the hematoma expansion, and then the mortality will be in, in your favor. So we, I think we, think we don't have evidence because we don't have, have a head-to-head -head trial. Right. Yeah. So and also, you can't like, any commentary on on the efficacy of something when you don't have a head to head trial. And that's the biggest problem with this paper is we and don't actually have any new evidence. They also could have done a subgroup analysis where they excluded patients with prior history of thromboembolic events and, and looked at uh, outcomes, but they did not show that data either. I love this Sounds discussion. Like it sounds like we could do a trial in which you select patients differently and see whether it affects outcomes differently. I mean, the company could also do a head-to-head -head trial. And I think it's very telling that they not only didn't do that, but they have the data to compare the, you know, the people who did get just PCC and they did not release that data. So. We're often on the side of wanting a drug or a device because we think it's good or cool. And the pharmacy says, no, 
so I love this discussion in which science is and and objective evidence is is sort of uh, what we're really focused on. Do we have any other comments? All right, I think this I is think definitely gonna come up discussion. at our anticoagulation. This is definitely gonna come up at our anticoagulation committee discussion. Um, so I think unless anyone wants to reach out to me, you can reach out to me privately or, or here. I, I seem to, I, I'm getting the vibe that I think our opinion is probably still the same moving forward. Great, thank you. Well, I, I think I think Chris takes care of more ICHs than anyone else, and so we we all lean heavily on his opinion for this. Yeah, I agree. Our, our department. All right, excellent. Well, thanks everyone for having us. Thank you for presenting. See you all next week. Thanks.